welcome to your dog cast where we feature news just for dog lovers here's your rover reporter mary lou davidson today we're going to wander a bit from the usual path on the rover reporter where we'll interview groomers trainers and veterinarians we're going to get into some deeper thinking about the canine and human bond and to join us in this conversation i'm happy to welcome dr Erhard vogel he is the founder and the leader of the Nataraja Yoga Center, Yoga and Meditation Center in La Jolla, California. He has a PhD in psychology and he's a dog lover. Welcome, Earhart. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks for coming on the show. Um, I've looked at your bio and I've heard you as a guest on other podcasts and people always refer to the period in your life where you gave up architecture and you went to study with the Hem Himalayan sages. And it, they kind of pass over that like it's just another benchmark of a lifetime. And I really wanted to ask you about that to kind of set the tone for what we'll be talking about. How did that come to be? Well, I spent about four, in 1970, I gave up my position in a world renowned architectural firm uh, to wander the earth. <laughs> and I spent four, and a, four years living out of a backpack and in a little tent, uh, mostly walking and hitchhiking through the United States, uh, Europe, all the Arab nations, the Afghanistan, India, Nepal, and so on. And I, when I arrived in India, it was like, coming home, because what India stands for, well, which isn't the whole country, is not what, what, what you would say is all spiritual, but they're very different from us here. Uh, but I went to the Himalayas where I met these two renowned, world-renowned sages. They had a calling throughout the world more than the Pope. I mean, they are, they are holy men. And they recognized me and took me in their midst and uh, we exchanged stories and techniques and so on and they were astonished and they said you know everything that we know we've learned through this rich rich history of of literature and you know, spiritual teachings like the puranas and the vedas and upanishads and what you have and uh, and you have all of that, but you don't have, have those teachings. You don't have that literature. Well, I had developed all of this on my own with a strange upbringing during World War II as a child with meeting death and so on. I had to, I had to straighten out quickly, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, so I didn't go there to study. I, they asked me to teach there. So... I was a rare specimen, a Westerner teaching among the Himalayan sages. Um, and they were my friends until, the two of them were my, my closest friends until they finally left the body. You know, they were old enough. They were in their late 80s and 90s, you know. So that's how that came about. Okay, so I've got to ask, um, was there a culture around dogs there? I mean, we know that in India, there's a closer relationship to nature and to sentient beings. It's an interesting question, but it's also, uh, so I was there in the 70s, and the, there would be dogs hanging around the ashrams. Ashrams are where the sages, or sometimes not sages, live. Um, they would come uh, because in the evening, gatherings afterwards they would always have like what they call prasad which is everybody partakes of like a little bit of dessert or something like that and it often was so uh untasty that it would be passed on to the dogs and that's what they lived of wow. uh, there were dogs but they were all on their own they didn't have collars and often they didn't have hair mostly they had mange and ribs sticking out you know yeah uh, nowadays that you'll see more dogs with a collar and on a leash and being cared for but it's not a culture where that happens often because it's really still very much a survival of the fittest culture you know there isn't 
there isn't anything left to feed pets. Right. Right. So, but uh, same thing with cows. The cows walk around freely there because they are all considered part of being. Everything that is, is being, right? I mean, we all be, <laughs> we all are. And that energy uh, of being is the essential thing about all of us. And so that's the interconnecting link between everything. So they consider every manifestation or every expression of being sacred. Yeah, and it's a sacred ecosystem and everybody kind yeah. of supports each other in the ecology so, of it. Right, and so the cows wander around on the streets and they, they eat the, the movie placards that are plenty off, off the walls and uh, or they will come sometimes to a vegetable seller who, who's squatting on the ground with a piece of cloth with the vegetables on it. But they always have a stick with which they hit the cows over the head when the cows come to steal vegetables, you know. So it's right. a casual relationship, you know. Gotcha. Well, getting back to what you mentioned about your youth when you were really just a little boy, do you remember anything about the culture around dogs in Germany before all hell bro broke loose? Well, during the war, uh, I don't remember seeing dogs. Well, I, I knew about dogs. But, you know, Germany has a love for dogs. They, in fact, they bred, you know, uh, they created certain breeds like the German Shepherd and so on. <coughs> and <coughs> as a child, that was my most fervent wish. Be beyond survival, my first uh, wish was to have a dog, but I could never have one because we couldn't even feed our family, you know. Right. Yeah. So, um, you're a German Shepherd guy, and you've yeah. had several in your lifetime. So, um, they tend to be super loyal and super um, bonded to one yes. person. Is there yeah. a particular type of training that you employ with your dogs? I I just employ some of the basics. Um, like, you know, that they stay with you when you're walking, that, you, that they heal, um, that they come when you call them, that they stay when you tell them to stay, and that they do what you say. But that's a way of when they're about eight weeks old already, you start to relate to them. It's a matter of relationship. You establish a relationship with them, which they're all about. They're all about relationship. That's right. And and it's always one of love and loyalty. So yeah. you, so you, when you start to, my first one that I had was 19, in 1974. Do you want to see a picture of him? Please. I have a picture of him that I brought here just for that. Oh, Erhard, he is a stunner, really. Yeah. What was his name? His name was Arjuna, which is a hero in in the Bhagavad Gita, one of the great, great uh, literatures of India. Anyway, so he was my first one. And it's like, it was worth waiting my life. So I was in my, I was close to 35 years old when I got my first dog. Mm -hmm. And he was just a magnificent creature. He was like most German shepherds are very intelligent. Um, he was with me all the time. So I bought, I bought a VW station wagon in uh, 1974 just for him to have because he was always with me. And he was, he was regal, as you could see in this picture, and big. I mean, he was over 100 pounds, which is big for a German Shepherd. And very handsome, but absolutely loyal and I taught him some of the basics and I had to be taught how to train a dog. And there was a, a neighbor lady here uh, who is like a terrific uh, dog trainer and she trained me. And I had difficulty uh, telling him what to do, you know, like heal. I wouldn't want to be told to heal. And she says, you got to overcome that because 
Number one, if he is not well trained, you can't have him with you in, in social occasions and so on. So he's going to be very restricted. Plus, training him, they love to be trained because he says, I can do what, he's what he wants me to do. Right. I can understand when he tells me something. Right. It's a whole communications path that opens up. Yeah. yeah. So the one I have now, August, he's just incredible. Okay. When he was less than a year old, I took him down to the lawn to teach him how to heal on a leash. Right. And it usually takes a few weeks for them to get it uh, on the leash. And then you train them to heal without a leash. Right. And that takes another, that takes even more time. And uh, I taught one time, I spent about the first time, 10 minutes training him how to heal. Next morning, I run down to the lawn. He runs next to me at heel. And I go on the lawn and I thought, well, we're, we're going the same place. That's why this is happening. But then I did like the figure eights and so on, which you do tight circles left and right. See if I could get rid of him. Now he just stuck to my leg as if he were, you know, glued to it. So, and that's how he still is. Yeah, you're lucky. Um, you know, you said something that um, reminded me that, you know, they live, in, they live in the now, they're all about the relationship. And I was thinking about the sensory world that dogs live in and that, you know, they can smell six million times more. Yes. It's amplified. Everything is amplified for them. So uh, their sensory world is all about what's right in front of them. So they don't have to worry about judging and they wake up happy. And they're also, um, they're problem solvers. So yes. if you present uh, them with a puzzle or if you're walking through the woods and there's a creek and they're not sure to how, how to get over it, they won't turn back. They'll find a way. Yeah, yeah. So it occurs to me that people could benefit from observing more. And that's kind of where you come from. Right. You know, I, I, it occurs to me while you're talking about that. I'm, I'm a teacher. I've been teaching for over 50 years. And I've taught all over the world. You know including in the Himalayan alliance with the sages. But when I was traveling like through Turkey, Afghanistan, Pakistan, you know, Saudi Arabia and so on, I taught all the time uh, because I wanted to study how, what is the, their relationship to reality, you know, uh, to reality, not belief systems or opinions and so on. And so in my teaching with them, I also learned what, what they are about. And I really learned that my main teacher in life is dogs. <laughs> I have learned more from dogs than from spiritual leaders <laughs> because they are, the dogs are true. They're honest. Well, most of them are. I mean, they. I have a little schnauzer, she's very smart, and I have two German shepherds, but she is in charge, you know? Wow, yeah. And she sometimes tries to convince me that I didn't feed her yet when I did. So <laughs> she's not totally honest. She's a trickster. But the German shepherds don't do that, <laughs> you know? They're, they're, it's not in their DNA to lie. Right. <laughs> not a devious bone in their body. And you know what? They are masters at loving. Mm. They just, and you know, they, they have their boundaries too. Um, they love you according to what you are like and what, what their relationship is with you. And I, I always marvel at in their relationship with me there limitless love there is no border to it there's no condition to it you know it's just love and no judging it doesn't matter what you look like or what the last thing you did was it they're still there for you no matter what 
The only thing that matters is how you relate to them. Right. They, I mean, a lot of dogs are abused and they still love the abusers, you know. But if you don't abuse them, the love is so much deeper and so much constant, so much more constant, you know. And they, they just absolutely love. And it's, it's always. Yeah. Like, like uh, August here, he, he sleeps in the living room. I sleep in the bedroom, of course, which is on the other side of the house. But if I stir at night, he gets up and I can hear his toenails on the wooden floor and he comes to check on me. Now he knows not to, he, he doesn't jump on the bed or anything. He knows not to even stick his nose further than just the edge of the bed because he doesn't want to wake me up, but he wants to check that I'm okay. He goes on patrol. Yeah, yeah. He goes on patrol. Well, Erhard, if you had, uh a couple of pieces of advice to give to humans about how to experience the world more like the way their dogs would, how would you position that to them? Oh, so much. <laughs> uh, be constant, be constant, be balanced, be real, be honest, uh, love, <laughs> learn to love. Right. You know, not if you do such and such, then I love you. No, you, that's not love. That's conditional, you know. Right. So just be open to just always <clears throat> loving. They are always loving. They live in love. Yeah. They're just amazing creatures, even when they bark when they're not supposed to. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, my, my youngest German Shepherd is about 14 months old, and she's all black. Her name is Angelica, but I call her the Black Demon because she was <laughs> wild with energy, just absolutely wild. Yeah. But she has to be wherever I am, whichever room I'm in, and she lies down with her snout on my, she always has to be on my foot. Mm -hmm. And so she, if I get up and go to another room, she gets up and goes to that room, back and forth, except she's not in here because I cannot, she, she makes too much uh, disturbance, you know, right. still, still crazy, you know. And is she super bonded to August? No, she wants to be, but he doesn't want it. <laughs> right. He, he says, don't bother me. So he snarls at her and she has little uh, correction marks on her black face from his, from his correcting her with his teeth. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's the but, great thing is that they communicate to each other in ways that humans don't really know how to. I mean, not that we would want to bite someone's face, but when I think about two dogs meeting, they get right to the point, right? And they, yeah. from their sense of smell, they can tell exactly where you've been and what you've done. But right. with, as humans, we're so reserved and standoffish when we meet somebody, uh, unless you're super outgoing. But so I, I wish for more of that. Well, the, the dogs have the habit of smelling each other's rear end usually <laughs> uh, when they meet. Yes. And we humans aren't allowed to do that. So <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> we suffer from a certain distance. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. All right. Well, I've enjoyed talking with you immensely about your background, about your puppy dogs and your outlook on oh, the bond and how dogs are just really the supreme kind of beings that we should all be more like. I'd like to tell you a little, uh, little history of mine with dogs. <gasps> one second, <clears throat> Earhart. Do you have one? <laughs> I need a moment. OK. Come on. I will definitely edit this out, but I'll just tell you that I have a Husky Shepherd mix. 
Oh, he's 70, 70 pounds and he's 15. Wow. So, yeah. So I kind of, <laughs> I give him a pass when something pops up. So, 15 is very old for a, a large dog. Yeah. When I showed you the picture of was 15 when he died from his stomach twisting. Oh, yeah. You know, that's, that's what happens to larger dogs and other animals like horses and so on. Yes, exactly. Okay. So... Tell me your story. Well, I have two sons who are grown up now. Um, in fact, my, my, the, the older son is, has been married for 10 years, but my younger son, who is now 32, he's going to get married this coming Sunday. And uh, they are both grown up with dogs, right? And they are the most wonderful people I know in life. Uh, they are not just because I'm their father, but they are, they, they never were a trouble in my life. They were always strong and responsible and very intelligent and so on. And I attribute it to the fact that when I was trained to train dogs, I translated that into my upbringing for my sons. I treated them like dogs, in other words, <laughs> but really, but in a good way. In the very best way, right. I, I treat my sons when they were two years old with the same respect that I would treat adults. And yes. Even, even high up adults, you know, the same respect and the same, I expected them to be responsible for themselves, even when they were two years old, that was my behavior towards them. It was a given. Everything that I teach is like really, really powerful stuff for people to be successful in life in a real way, in the fundamental ways, the, the, in terms of our real identity and who we really are. And my sons have never come to any of my classes, but they live and act everything that I teach. They are like my, my most successful students. Yes. And I also think that growing up around dogs enhances yes. the childhood. And you always have someone to talk to if something goes wrong. And it's just That's very right. different than cats. And, you know, dogs require more hands-on help, you know, for walking and feeding and stuff like that. Yeah. Well, uh, the dogs, like, okay, the one I showed you the picture of, he grew up when Dylan was, my first one, Dylan, was a baby. So they grew up together. Yeah. And I have pictures of them together where the dog is, is larger than Dylan standing up, you know, yeah. and they would fight over the same tennis balls and Dylan right. would cry when, when the dog took the tennis ball or got there faster, which he always did, you know. But... Dylan is a brilliantly intelligent person, and he is like sweet. He's like a teddy bear. He is just, yeah. just a wonderful, generous person who treats everybody with respect, you know, and, and, and with equality. This, that, that sense of equality, treating people as equals is so powerful and Dylan, both of my sons are that way, absolutely. Yeah. Just like a dog. Yeah. And I never had never had problems with them like the terrible twos or teenage problems, uh, you know, or drugs or alcohol. Nothing ever. And they are they're totally self empowered and independent, but they treat me with complete love. Yeah. Awesome. Just like the dogs. And they all grew up, I'd say them, oh, Dylan, I love you. I love you almost as much as Arjuna. <laughs> my younger one who, who, you know, Arjuna was long dead when, when my, when my uh, Nicholas was born. He, all, he knows that I love you almost as much as Arjuna. <laughs> oh, that's sweet. Yeah, now, do they have dogs? Yes. Awesome. Um, 
the uh, my older son doesn't have dogs because it's not allowed in the, the house he is renting. Mm. But my younger son has two wonderful rescue dogs that are just, they like to be like this. <laughs> and they always sleep with their cheek next to him or right on his legs, you know. Snuggle bunnies. Well, they better get ready for the new bride, right? Oh, they are ready. They, they, they love her. Yeah. They love her even more than him. Mm -hmm. So yeah. they, you know, it's like, okay, Nicholas, we love you, but uh, almost as much as, as Arjuna and the other two dogs. <laughs> Hilarious. Yeah. Well, this has been great. And I would encourage everybody, if you'd like to learn more about Earhart, best thing to do is just Google Earhart Vogel, and you'll find all kinds of information about him, yes. about his books, about the Nataraja Meditation and Yoga Center in La Jolla. And we hope that he'll come back and chat with us sometime soon about dogs and all things wonderful. Oh, we could talk about cats, too, because I have two cats. Well, this is the Rover Reporter, though, don't you know? <laughs> yeah. Listen to this. I used to have, I have an aviary outside, and I used to have about 60 canaries and finches in there. I mean, they fly around. They have a lot of room. I had a uh, saltwater aquarium with beautiful, beautiful creatures in it. And now I still have a koi pond with great, big, beautiful, colorful koi in it. So, yeah, yeah, and I have two cats. <laughs> you you have to feed the koi, right? Yes. 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 Um, I have cats too. I have three tuxedo cats that I never planned on having. They just came. Uh huh. Uh, I'm going to show you my husky shepherd. Oh yes. Let's see if I can find him if he's not up to no good. Obviously, I'll cut this recording off before we get to this part. Okay, okay. Hi, Code. I think it'd be nice to sh show your dog in this episode. I can, yeah. What's his name? Um, I have two. Hi, Cody. Kodiak. Oh. Yeah. And then I have... A Yorkie. <laughs> oh, yes, yes. Cody, come here, hon. Hi, good boy. That's Earhart. Say hi to Earhart. Is that Cody? That's Cody, yeah. Hi, Cody, Cody. <laughs> well, I guess that's his whole appearance. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> that's so, right. He's beautiful. Thank you. I adore him. You can imagine after 15 years, we're pretty close. Yes, yes. Well, yeah. what you just said, I adore him. That I think that is common among dog owners. You know? Well, yeah. I mean, honestly, I started my dog career with a Shetland sheepdog. And he was so smart, Earhart, that literally he could do a crossword puzzle. <laughs> and so when he passed, I thought every dog would be like that. And so I got this Husky Shepherd and he was so bouncy, I could not even put a leash on him. He probably should have been medicated. <laughs> but um, literally when we went out, I had to go out the front door, open the car door and say, go to the car. And he would run to the car. But yeah. so I expected to have this very active social life with this dog, but he was epileptic. Oh. And, uh, so what I had envisioned the last 15 years being didn't happen. He's really confined to my yard and my house. It's a pretty good life, trust me. Yeah. But uh, it's been different. And so that was a, it was a hard thing. Can he not ride in your car? He can ride in my car um, and we can go places where there aren't other dogs. But once he started having seizures, um, 
you know, dogs can smell when there's a problem, other dogs, yeah. Yeah. and he gets attacked. Oh yeah, yeah. So we can't be at the park or any place like that where you would right. interact right. with other dogs. So but he gets along with your other dog, does he? Yeah, and the cats. Uh huh. But this is his pack. Yes, right. Yeah. yeah. So. Well, he's very lucky. You must have taken good care of him to live that long. I have taken pretty good care of him to the best of my ability because I'm not a vet, but my vet knows me very well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, I think uh, having a good vet, vet is a treasure. I have that good fortune to have a wonderful vet who is very devoted and very knowledgeable. So that helps a lot. Mm -hmm. yeah. What do you? They do, they do get ill at times. Yeah. You know? yeah. Um, Emmett. Emmett. Come here. Come here, Emmett. Say hi to Earhart. He's busy. He doesn't have time to play with you all day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I've got three of those. So I like, I like cats too, because they are, they are quite different as animals or as, as beings different from dogs, because they are, they march to their own drama, typically, right? <laughs> they make their own decisions, and they will yes. only do what you want if that's what they already wanted anyway, <laughs> right? Right. But... Um, I have these two cats that are brothers, they're three, and one is kind of mine and the other one is my husband's. And I've treated them very differently, um, although I love them both. But this one is mine. And so he comes when he's, he comes when he's called. Um, he can occasionally, he will sit for me. Uh, and he is extremely loving. Uh -huh. So the other one's loving too, but this one, he's right here all the time. Yeah, yeah. Well, with animals, they are so loving that you can feel the love even across the room. And if, even if you have to correct them sometimes, or if you, you know, have to correct them loudly, they'll forgive you right away. Except my um, my schnauzer, she's now four and a half years old and she feels that she's mature enough to make her own decisions and obey when she feels like it. And then if she does, if she does that, I might correct her and she she won't speak to me for the rest of or be with me for the rest of the day. Can you um, hurdle that challenge with a treat? Oh, yeah, yeah. Treat. <laughs> She'll take the treat and then walk away. <laughs> yeah. I mean, she knows how to hold a grudge. Yeah. Yeah, that's the great. German Shepherds don't. They don't even know what that is. They're just pure. Yeah. So. But no, actually, they do, do hold on to uh, like childhood treatments. Like I. Um, the I had a, a wonderful breeder live next to me where where I got my German Shepherds from, and one time uh, just at the week before Christmas, she gave me a three month old puppy, beautiful wow. dog, but she had been bought by somebody else at uh, eight weeks, and by a young um, adult man, and. Uh, he returned her and it became evident by her behavior that he must have abused her a lot. And even though I treated her, I knew about that and I saw the behavior in her and gave her a lot of, lot of extra treatment and she still had it in her all the while until she died. I mean, she, she was still an absolutely loving dog, but she was very cautious a lot of times. Timid, yeah. And she was sometimes fierce in terms of protection, protecting me or herself because she always feared, you know. Yeah. Whereas the, the other guys, they are just, 
they're just casual and relaxed. The German shepherds often are fearful because they're so protection oriented. That's why they are so protection oriented. You know, they mm. watch. They're intelligent enough to see when there's a possibility of danger. Yeah, yeah I wondered. You know, if you've ever explored that Schutzend training method. No, I never did that. I mean, I've looked into it and so on. Um, I, I want them to grow up for me, just in a much more casual, not so disciplined way. Uh, I believe a lot in discipline, but it has to be self-discipline for me, mm -hmm. not imposed dis discipline, you know, mm -hmm. and I want them to grow up and just be happy characters, you know, and to, to be true to their nature, not, not just be obedient to me. I, I don't want that, you know? Yeah. It's more like enslavement. Yeah, right, right. I feel. I want to have a companion, not not a subject. You know? Right, a trained yeah. monkey yeah. kind of thing. Yeah, I feel the same way, but I will definitely, with my next dog, explore training more um, because I'd like to do, you know, therapy and that kind of thing, be able to visit uh, hospitals and stuff. Yeah, well, I can do that with my dogs and just because of the way they've grown up with me and they're just completely compliant and they they can go into the hospital and understand the situation. Mm -hmm. How here's one, the, the very uh, scared one, the one who had been mistreated, she died uh, at the age of 12. One day I'd had at my wrist under the skin somewhere a terrible itching for several months. And I didn't know how to get rid of it. Uh, creams and such, such wouldn't touch it because it was under the skin. And one day she came, her name was Nala, she came and licked there. And I said, oh, that felt good. And then, because it was itching, and I just kept my hand there and she licked that, that uh, wrist for close to 20 minutes. After a while, I started to look at the clock and this is like taking a long time. She just right. kept at it and at it and at it. At the, when she was done, the itch was all gone and it never came back. And it wow. had been there for a number of months before. Yeah, so I wonder what kind of magic that know? was. How yeah, did you know? it was underneath the skin They did did not have an odor or a scent or anything like that. But mm -hmm. she knew. Well, they just never oh. cease to amaze me. This is a beauty. His name is Finn. He's oh, I have I have friends who have a dog named Finn. <laughs> yeah, he's 13 and um, he wow. just excels at being cute that's about yeah. it <laughs> yeah. uh not the smartest dog i've ever met but the cutest one of the cutest yeah. anyway Are you well, he, play? he doesn't have to be smart he's spoiled i can see that on his face <laughs> yeah yeah i mean i also you might be interested in talking with me about this later but um i have a lot of contacts now naturally in the dog world. And one of the big um, bones of contention, if you will, is that fur baby culture is really more restrictive to dogs than it should be. For example, in Europe, you'll of often see people walking off leash, you know, in the middle of town with their dog right. at their, and, you know, it doesn't mean they, but they're not going to be the kind of dogs that people dress up or yeah, oh i hate that <laughs> yes so even though this whole fur baby culture has led to advancements in veterinary medicine you know which can put you in bankruptcy before you know it um but you know are we really doing the right thing by our dogs by this pampering and you know just the whole business e economy that's built up against uh, right. selling all that. 
to me it's it's a lot what you're saying is to me a, a cause for a lot of concern i brought up my dogs as i said the way i brought up my my sons and i still do that uh, i we have a certain understanding of discipline so that we can have a, a flourishing relationship, that they can be free. They can go with me wherever I go in public and with other people, and they know what to do, and they're always liked very much. They're fussed over because they're so good, you know, right. and they're beautiful also. And people just love to see how such... Like German Shepherds are very powerful and they're very intelligent. And that's such a powerful being can love people. It's just a wonderful thing, you know? Yeah, they're really majestic. Yeah, yeah. Um, I had my dog, uh, actually, my front door had a lever on it. Uh huh. And my Shepherd Husky opened the door and ran out one day. And I looked down the street, he was a block away and he was hanging around some county workers who were working on a light. Well, I whistled and from a football field away, he flew. Uh -huh. He flew in a way that other neighbors came over and were like, what kind of dog is that? Cause it looks <laughs> like a wolf. Uh -huh. So, uh, they just have the fluidity of movement that's so stunning. Yeah. yeah feel yeah. like you're in a magical kingdom with them. I know. And my, my two German shepherds, when they play together, they are so wild. They sometimes look they're gonna, like they're going to kill each other, but they're just playing. Yeah. And they're rolling and they're running <laughs> at full speed and then they roll over each other and so on. And they have so much fun. And your dogs smile, right? They right. see them smile, you know? Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, Erhard, I'm going to let you go. And I so appreciate your taking the time to talk with the Rover Reporter. Oh, boy, you got me on a topic uh, you could have... <laughs> Have me talk about all the time. Well, we'll be back in touch. You know, I saw your shepherd, I think, in the yard one day when you were talking to Sloan, and I thought, hmm, <laughs> maybe there's something to talk about. And boy, was I right. So you have a great day. I'll well, let thank you, you very much. You too. I'll let you know when everything's ready to go live. And, okay. Uh, we'll put links in the show notes to your sites. Great. Great. Okay. Thank well, you very for... nice to meet you, Mary Lou, and I enjoyed talking with you. I know, finally. I mean, I feel like I already knew you because I've watched uh -huh, uh -huh. <laughs> Sloan's pieces. But yeah, it's about time we had a meet and greet. Great, great. Thank you. Well, all the best to you. And uh, love yourself as much as your dogs love you, and you'll be having a wonderful life. That's a great quote. Thank you. All right. <laughs> Talk to you later. Bye. Bye-bye. Yeah.